They saw it coming. That morning, these air traffic controllers witnessed it all. I very quietly turned to the supervisor and I said, I think something is seriously wrong with this plane. They were handling those four flights when they were hijacked, a lost signal. I said, American 11, is that you? And then came the next transmission. A chilling message, a horrifying sight. He pointed out the window and said, uh, look at the World Trade Center. The nightmare in the making, from the first clues to the terrible finish. Our skies were turned into a war zone. And then they accomplished what has never been done before. They cleared the skies to save more lives. To land almost 5,000 airplanes without a single error is a feat of airmanship that I don't think will ever be equal. Tonight on Dateline, for the first time, the air traffic controllers in charge of those doomed flights tell Tom Brokaw what they saw and heard and did, as America remembers. Here now is Tom Brokaw. Good evening. Where were you on September 11th? Today, certainly here in New York, with all the sad memories and solemn memorials, we've heard answers from a number of people, grieving family members, survivors, government officials. But there is one group we have not heard from. They saw the attack coming from the very beginning to the end. They are the air traffic controllers who were in charge of America's airspace that morning. What they witnessed, even now, is hard to fathom. And what they managed to do had never been done before. Tonight, for the first time, they tell their compelling story. It was a beautiful day. It was a great day to be flying. Contact Boston Center on 125. Controllers are doing a great job moving the airplanes. Runway 4 left, clear for takeoff. Nothing was different. September 11th seems a perfect day to fly in the Northeast. Daybreak was crisp and bright. There was unlimited visibility, no ceiling. Conditions were just right. Northwest 553, your reback is correct. We were very busy. Things were moving nicely. Zero one Fox, you may see traffic inbound for runway four right. As usual, the skies over America that day were crowded with airplanes, often 4,000 to 6,000 airborne at any given time. For air traffic controllers, keeping them moving safely and on time is an intricate choreographed ballet each plane moving through the air at different speeds, altitudes, and headings. It is a thing of beauty. It is like clockwork. Making it all happen is a complex mix of manpower and technology, procedure and judgment. The pressure is constant, the stress unrelenting. British Midland 701, descend and maintain flight level 350. Despite the computers and training, the backup systems and safety equipment, in the end, it is the air traffic controllers who must, at a moment's notice, make sense of it all. But on this day, nothing would make sense. You're ingrained to know that you're going to be faced with adversity or possibly even death. You always wonder, you know, the, the law of averages, uh, that sooner or later something's going to happen. And you just hope that it's not on your shift. But for these 20 air traffic controllers and hundreds of others across the U.S., it did happen on their shift. One year ago today, the morning of September 11th, they watched in disbelief as four passenger planes were hijacked back to back in little more than an hour. They were as stunned as the rest of us, working in uncharted territory, but at the same time forced to make critical decisions. Hundreds of thousands of lives were at risk. Tonight, for the first time, they all share their story, what they saw, what they felt the turn, as they were witness to, the, to the most devastating tragedy in aviation history. How much of that day has lingered with you? The whole day. Still think about it? Yeah. There's not a day goes by where you don't have to think about it. It all began at Boston's Logan Airport. It's morning rush hour. Planes are already stacked on the runway waiting to get final clearance for takeoff. 8 a.m. American Flight 11, bound for Los Angeles, pushes back from the gate and is cleared for takeoff. The Boeing 767 with 81 passengers, 11 crew, and 24,000 gallons of jet fuel lifts off, headed west. As the plane climbs out of Boston Logan, it's handed off from one air traffic control center to the next. By 8.10 a.m., American Flight 11 
is in the hands of Boston's regional en route center, which is located 50 miles outside the city. More than 75 controllers are on duty at the time. Among them, Tom Roberts, Lino Martins, Don Jeffroy, John Hartling, Pete Zalewski, and Mike Blake. Within minutes, the 767 is climbing through 20,000 feet and onto Pete Zalewski's radar. I initially climbed him to flight level 290, 29,000 feet. 8.14 a.m., 14 minutes since takeoff. American 11 is headed up to its cruising altitude of 35,000 feet, but not before Zalewski radios the pilot a routine order to turn Six, to keep enough space between American 11 eight, and another plane. Nine. I turned him the 20 degrees right, he took the turn. I then told American 11, climb and maintain flight level 350, 35,000 feet. There was no response. A moment of concern, perhaps, but that was not uncommon. At that point, I was just thinking that it was you know, maybe the pilots weren't paying attention or there's something wrong with the frequency. Zalewski followed procedures, continuing to try to raise American 11 on the frequency. And at first, it was pretty much, you know, American 11, you know, are you paying attention, are you listening? And there was still no response. I uh, used the emergency frequency uh, to try and get a hold of him through that. There was no response. By now, Zalewski is running a mental checklist, trying to account for the loss of communication, a technical problem, or maybe a mistake on the pilot's part. I went back to the previous sector to see if the pilot had accidentally flipped the switch back over on the, uh, on the radio. At that point, there was still, we had nothing. We weren't hearing from him. American 11 was Nordo, no radio contact. Zalewski stepped up his efforts. I would go on to call that aircraft 12 times. And as it went on, I even began to get more concerned. You're watching American 11 at that point as well? You know? Yes, he was in uh, my airspace at that time. Colleague Lino Martins, working nearby, is now also tracking the American Airlines plane. I saw him start the right charge, figuring Pete was going to climb him. That's when Pete called and said, no, he's staying at 290 because he didn't respond. He's Nordo. I said, we're not talking to him. And uh, he was the last assigned at 29, but he may have heard the 35. I'm not sure what he might do here, so just wa watch him. At that point, again, I didn't think anything was wrong. But the second controller did have incoming flights directly in the path of American 11. I had a plan ahead on this new heading he was on. He was uh, opposite direction with my Boston arrivals, and I had to get them underneath him. But then, at 8.20 a.m., American 11 abruptly changes course, turning to the northwest. I then saw the transponder shut off. And I'm thinking, well, maybe there's really something wrong. First, there's no radio. Now we lost this transponder. Every commercial airplane is equipped with a transponder that transmits a constant signal. The signal gives controllers on the ground a steady flow of information displayed on radar screens in a data block, such as this one. Think of it as the airplane's vital signs, the carrier, flight number, speed, and altitude. If the transponder is not working, the plane is simply a blip on radar. Controllers can see only the location and the speed of the plane. And so I very quietly turned to the supervisor and I said, would you please come over here? I said, I think something is seriously wrong with this plane. I don't know what. It's either mechanical, electrical, I think, but I'm not sure. D did you suspect hijacking at that point? Absolutely not. No way. American 11 has been Nordo for six minutes, and now other controllers are becoming concerned. Tom Roberts tries yet another method to contact the plane. I would happen to be working another American flight on my frequency. One of our uh, procedures or protocols is to go aircraft to aircraft on a company frequency to see if the pilots from one flight can uh, talk to the pilots of another flight. But that too fails. There still is no reply. The silence increasingly ominous as the jet, now drastically off course, flying in a northwesterly direction toward Albany, New York. Controllers are scrambling to help create a safe zone around the runaway plane, moving every other flight in the area out of the way, from the ground all the way up to 35,000 feet. Pretty much awesome. moved all the airplanes from, right. from, from Albany, New York, to Syracuse, New York, know. out of the way, because that's the track that he was going on. I didn't know when he was going to turn back, if he was going to turn back on course. And we had no altitude information. So, so it's not just altitude. clearing the altitudes of conflicting right. traffic. It was it's that whole altitude stratum from the ground up to 35,000. It's now 8.24 a.m., 10 minutes since losing contact. That's when controllers see the plane make another unauthorized turn, this time to the left, going south. When he started his left turn, I was thinking, oh, great, maybe he's getting back on course. But then he continued the left turn, 
I said, wait a minute, something's going on here. This is not right. And that's when I heard the first transmission from the aircraft. And I wasn't quite sure what it, what it was because it was just a, a foreign voice. It was something very different. To me, it sounded almost uh, Middle Eastern. And I asked, I said, American 11, is that you? American 11, are you trying to call me? And then came the next transmission. And in that transmission, I immediately knew something was very wrong. And I knew it was a hijack. And what did you hear? Um, I remember the part of them saying they were going back to the airport. And by that, I deduced that they were going to go back to Boston. That's what I was thinking. And I didn't believe it was, was one of the American pilots on board. I, I immediately stood up and yelled at the supervisor, John, get over here immediately right now. And I just remember everybody in that building and in the aisle just looking at me like, what is wrong with you? Zalewski cannot make out exactly what the hijackers are saying, but the tone of their voices alone chills him. I felt from those voices the terror. For some reason, I knew something would seem worse than just a normal hijack. It just seemed very different to me. Just was Did your heart skip a beat at that point? You guys are known for your cool. Um, we are. And I think I just, I went into do your job mode. Zalewski immediately asks for an assistant to help listen to the transmissions coming from the plane and puts the frequency on a speaker so others can hear. And he notifies the supervisor there is a hijacking, the first one on a U.S. carrier in more than a decade. And then the supervisor came over and uh, that's when we realized something was serious. And he headed southbound towards uh, New York at a high rate of speed. As Boston Center supervisors notify the FAA and other air traffic centers about the hijacking, Zalewski anxiously listens on the frequency, thinking the hijackers might try to make contact. Then comes a third transmission from the aircraft. Um, and that one was pretty horrifying. And um, I can just remember the people in the aisle that I was working with. That was the first time they were able to hear the voices also, other than just myself. <clears throat> and I remember one of uh, the controllers that was sitting two over from me just say, that is really scary. Zalewski, concerned he might be missing vital information, asked the supervisor to have someone pull the transmission tapes that are automatically recorded right away. And thank thankfully they did pull the tapes, and a part that I didn't hear, which was we have more, more planes or something to that effect, and that really was a key statement. You heard those tapes? Uh, yes, I did. I heard exactly what Pete heard, and uh, we had to actually listen to it a couple of times just to make sure that we were hearing what we heard. I've heard a number of different tapes in the past of aircraft crashes, and this was, in my mind, the worst. I'd, I'd never heard um, something like that. Was it just cold-blooded? We have a lot of airplanes, and... It made you, uh, it made you actually step up and think. What did he mean? What, what's going on? Uh, you know, what's, what's next? The voice they're most likely hearing is that of Mohammed Atta, who would later come to be known as the mastermind of the terrorist attacks. Controllers believe the hijackers mean to speak to the passengers, mistakenly keying the mic to air traffic control and Pete Zalewski instead. By now, American 11 had crossed into airspace John Hartling controls. And Tom came over and told me that this, this aircraft, we believe, is hijacked, and he's last reported at 29,000 feet. What did you think when he said the word hijack? I didn't believe him, because I didn't think that that stuff would happen anymore, especially in this country. The plane is now speeding south at almost 600 miles an hour, far faster than the 450 miles an hour it should have been flying. With no transponder information, Controllers were now asking the assistance of another plane heading to the West Coast that morning. It is United Flight 175. I said, I'd like you to look at your 12 or 1 o'clock. Tell me if you see an American 767. And he said, uh, yeah, he's about 28, 29,000. The United flight that Hartling was speaking to had also taken off from Boston's Logan Airport, only 14 minutes after American 11. In fact, it was also a Boeing 767 fully fueled, bound for Los Angeles. It was carrying 58 passengers and six crew. Hartling had no way of knowing that five terrorists are also on board this plane, 
only moments away from making their move. I said, well, turn, th turn 30 degrees to the right. I want to make sure I keep you away from this guy. Because I had no idea where he was going. So you're still in touch with the pilots in that cockpit? Yeah. Now that the second United plane was safely back on course, or so he thought, John Hartling handed it off to the next link in the air traffic chain, the New York area en route center. And you're keeping your eye on American, American 11. He still now is going at a very high rate of speed. No, his speed started to drop drastically. And what did that say to you? That uh, he was descending. probably descending. Descending rapidly, headed in the direction of New York. Like the rest of us, controllers still had no idea where. At the New York en route center in Islip, Long Island, Dave Botiglia, Kurt Applegate, and Mark De Palma are working a routine shift. No idea what is about to come their way. At 8.41 a.m., United Flight 175 enters Dave Botiglia's airspace and makes contact. The first thing he said to me was, we heard threatening transmissions being broadcast by the American. The pilots of the United flight have monitored a transmission from the hijacked plane, repeating to Batiglia what they overheard in the American cockpit. And his exact words were, everyone stay in your seats. The crew of 175 has no way of knowing they are only moments away from also being hijacked. By now, American 11 is crossing out of Boston's airspace and is bearing down on Batiglia's territory in New York. Within seconds, the plane, or target as controllers call it, appears on his screen. The controller right next to me gets up and walks over to me and he says, you see this target here? He says, this is American 11. Boston Center thinks it's a hijack. So what did you think at that point? What was going through your mind? I really thought they were probably going to Cuba. So you kept track of the target? Kept track of the target. And now, we, of course, we know that he was descending at a rapid pace, but we had no altitude or anything on him. So you didn't know how fast he was going down through the altitudes? That's correct. Within minutes, American 11 simply disappears from radar. It is 8.46 a.m. The only thing I can remember is when the American target disappeared, all I said was, well, we know he's not high altitude anymore. But within seconds, Botiglia has another unexpected problem. As he and other controllers search the radar, looking for American 11, he suddenly notices that United Flight 175, which moments ago helped him locate the hijacked plane, also has disappeared. Instinctively, Botiglia knows the two are somehow related. He asks another controller to take over all of his other planes. When I think my voice was shaking. Please just take everything and don't ask any questions. He calls the United planes several times, unsuccessfully sharing the same anxiety his colleagues in Boston had felt only moments earlier. Kurt Applegate the, uh, is working at the next radar bank in the, in the New York Center. I, I could hear the talking behind me, and I realized he had two lost airplanes. That made me very nervous. I know something bad's happening. I really don't know what. We had no transmissions from the United. When I turned back to look at the radar, there was a target right over Allentown. So I turned and yelled to Dave. I thought that was his American that he was looking for. But you're in fact are looking at United. I was in fact looking at United, that's correct. A transponder signal quickly reappears on radar somewhere near the New Jersey-Pennsylvania border. A mistake, perhaps, on the part of the hijackers. The signal continues to transmit information to controllers. There is no longer any question in Botiglia's mind that he's looking at a second hijacked airliner. The United flight is no longer heading west as it should be. Instead, it is turning ominously toward the east. Well, when I saw it, it was at 33,000 feet. And as soon as I said that, he, he started to turn to the left and descending. Did you continue to watch the United target move across the screen? Yeah, I was just looking at, at this United flight as he descended through traffic. You know, I'll tell you what, it damn near had a midair.
For the first time, we're learning about a near mid-air collision. Applegate and Botiglia showed Dateline how United Flight 175, streaking through the skies over New York at more than 600 miles an hour, barely missed colliding with another commercial flight. Delta 2315, en route to Tampa, Florida, from Bradley Airport in Connecticut. Applegate listens in disbelief as the controller next to him scrambles to move the other plane out of the way. God, I heard stuff from him I didn't think I'd ever hear in my career, ever. The frantic calling and the traffic calls, traffic two o'clock, 10 miles. I think he's been hijacked. I don't know his intentions. Take any evasive action necessary. That's something you hear in the movies, not on the job. It was a terrifying moment just to watch the two airplanes miss by less than, I think it was 200 feet. United 175 barely misses a fiery mid-air collision, a crash that, while catastrophic, could have saved lives by keeping the plane from reaching its target, the South Tower of the World Trade Center. There are now two hijacked airliners in the skies over the East Coast, the first, American 11, has already disappeared from radar. Controllers don't know where it is. The second is United 175, now over northern New Jersey suburbs. And in Newark, New Jersey, a third plane and group of controllers will be pulled into the unfolding drama. Dan D'Agostino is a controller at the Newark Tower. And if you look out that window there, that's they're all lined up just as we were on September 11th. The morning shift is running smoothly other than the usual ground delays at Newark. We had about uh, 25 to 30 planes at the runway at any given moment. For an Greg Callahan is clearing planes to take off and land. Only five minutes earlier, at 8.41 a.m., he had cleared a United plane to take off for San Francisco. It had been waiting on the runway, and by the time it took off, it was almost 40 minutes late. At the time, Callahan had no reason to give it a second thought. But... The story of what would happen on that airliner, the bravery and heroism of 33 passengers and seven crew would become legend. It was United Flight 93. But minutes after Flight 93 takes off, uneventfully, something does grab the attention of Newark controllers whose view from the top of the tower is a panorama of New York skyline. Working alongside Callahan is Rick Tepper. I just happened to glance up and uh, saw a uh, mushroom cloud coming off the uh, first tower. We knew it was an explosion type of fire. I said, Greg, look at that. He was off my left shoulder and he pointed out the window and said, uh, look at the World Trade Center. He's going, oh my God, look at that. So we were just standing there staring and just, just in disbelief watching it, watching it burn. The initial reports a small private plane appears to have crashed into the tower. Bob Varkatapane was the supervisor in Newark Tower that morning in charge of eight controllers. You can see the smoke from here. Oh, yes, you can see the smoke billowing from the side of the uh, building. And we didn't know what it was. We uh, contacted LaGuardia, Kennedy Tower, and Teterboro Tower to find out if they lost an airplane. And they all said they didn't know what it was. I got on the phone to the en route uh, air traffic control facility out in New York on Long Island and I asked them if they lost any airplanes and they said no but Boston Center lost an airplane they lost an American 767 they did it occur to you at that point that it could have been that plane that went into the world Trade well that's exactly what I said to myself I said to the controller that I have a burning building and you have a missing airplane this is very coincidental as Bob Barcatapane trades calls with the New York and Boston centers, a horrific realization dawns on controllers. American Flight 11, still missing from radar, finally has been found. Word of the fate of Flight 11 quickly travels throughout the air traffic control world. Back at the New York center, all eyes are now trained on United 175 as it races over central New Jersey, clearly headed toward New York. I know that an airplane has hit the Trade Center, but we were still hoping that the United was not going to do that. Until now, controllers thought, hoped, the plane was headed toward Kennedy Airport to land. But with each second, it is becoming more clear that whoever is in control of the cockpit of the United plane 
has a different plan. New York Center alerts another nearby air traffic facility, the one responsible for lower altitude planes. I got a call from New York Center saying we have an aircraft at 24,000 feet. We don't, he's not talking to anybody. We don't know where he's going. Don Crivellevi is on duty that morning. His colleagues, John Smith, John Riccardi, and Dean Iacopelli. Probably 10 miles into my airspace, he started descending. I pointed him out to John. And said, watch this aircraft. It's coming through. We don't know what's going to happen. And uh, we just watched him go down. 8.52 AM. It has been six minutes since American 11 hit the North Tower. And NORAD, responsible for the defense of the North American airspace, is now alerted to a second hijacking. It scrambles two F-15 fighter jets from Otis Air Force Base in Massachusetts to potentially intercept the United plane. But they are more than 150 miles and some 20 minutes away. The rest of the country, watching on television, still believes the crash in New York is an accident. But these controllers, now watching in horror as the second plane bears down on lower Manhattan, are the first to know the awful truth. We know he's going to crash. That's, that's pretty much a given. We don't know where he's going to crash. I think we all knew that something was going to happen, be it the Statue of Liberty, the Empire State Building. It was highlighted to me so that I could watch it as it came in from the southwest and then made a direct turn towards the South Tower. When it made that direct turn, did you think, oh my god? I thought it was a fighter jet coming in to cover the city. As it turned out, it just continued to descend through 5,000 feet and lower. And that's when my soup came up and said, you know, you could probably consider him a terrorist at this point. And you kind of just turn around and got this kind of empty feeling. It was helpless. You couldn't do yeah. it. Yeah. You know, you sit there for 10 years controlling planes. For the first time in your life, you don't have any control of this at all. At Newark Tower, Bob Varkatapane is still on the phone with a controller at the New York Center and learns that a second plane has been hijacked and is almost on top of Manhattan. He says to me, as a matter of fact, do you see that target coming over the Verrazano Bridge? I went over to the radar and looked at the radar. The Verrazano Bridge is depicted on the radar. Right. And I looked over there and I saw the aircraft descending out of 4,700 feet, 3,600 feet, 2,700 feet. I can hear him calling on altitudes. I have a target in sight. He's descending rapidly. And he said, uh, look out to the southeast. And uh, the gentleman working ground control said, hey, who's that? By the Verrazano Bridge. And here comes a very large target, descending rapidly, very fast. He was in a, in a hard right bank, diving very steeply and very fast. And he, uh, as he was coming up the Hudson River, he, he made another hard left turn and uh, just heading for downtown Manhattan. It was fast. Very fast. He's really moving. moving. He was moving fast. Anybody in the room say anything at that point, or are you just uh, transfixed by what you were seeing? Well, that pretty much confirmed all our worst fears as to if there's anything in the back of your mind saying maybe this just was something minor. Basically, everyone, there was a moment of silence, and then things really started to move. You could see that he was trying to line himself up on the tower. Just before he hit the tower, he almost leveled it out and just, just hit the building. I was still talking to this, the center at that time, and I just said, oh, my God, he just hit the World Trade Center. And uh, you could see him go in the side of the building, and then you just saw the, the flames and explosion erupting out the other side of the building. What was going on in this room at that time? Uh, there was disbelief. They couldn't believe what we just saw. They knew it was coming, but until they saw it happen with their own eyes, it was too hard to believe. As the second strike plays out on live television, the rest of the country is also in shock, finally understanding what these controllers already knew. America is under attack. Controllers in the tower immediately wonder, could there be a third attack on the way? Supervisor Bob Barcatapane takes immediate action. I immediately went to the phone and called Washington, D.C. to tell them that Newark was ceasing operations. We were not moving any airplanes. Who did you call in Washington? I called the Air Traffic Control System Command Center. You have a hotline right in? Yes, I have a phone directly to that center. I told them that Newark was ceasing operations. We would not accept any aircraft landing at Newark Airport. I wanted, my main concern was keeping airplanes out of this airspace. New York City was just attacked twice, so then we uh, shut down. I believe that was the beginning of shutting down the national airspace system. 
As Newark controllers shut down their airport, they have no way of knowing that one of their own planes, United Flight 93, cleared for takeoff only moments before the first tower was hit, is about to face its own crisis. At yet another air traffic control center in Cleveland, Stacy Taylor is keeping a close eye on her flights. The FAA is warning controllers to watch transcontinental flights headed west for anything suspicious. And then something very suspicious does happen. I hear one of the controllers behind me go, oh my God, oh my God, and he starts yelling for the supervisor. He goes, what is this plane doing? What is this plane doing? I wasn't that busy at the time. And I pulled it up on my screen, and he was climbing and descending and climbing and descending, but very gradually. He'd go up 300 feet, he'd go down 300 feet. And it turned out to be United 93. By this time, United Airlines has warned crews still in the air about the potential for a hijacking. Electronic messages similar to an email have been transmitted to pilots. Beware cockpit intrusion, the message read. The pilots on Flight 93 type back, confirmed. At the Boston Center, controllers are taking matters into their own hands to safeguard crews. I saw controllers step up to the plate and start warning flight crews. This was totally by the seat of their pants. It's not because they're directed to by anybody. It's just, okay, everybody's on alert right now. Watch for cockpit intrusion, that kind Absolutely. of Absolutely. And I'm like, yeah, go for it. And in New York, controllers brace themselves for another possible assault on their airspace. Did you keep thinking, my God, there may be another target coming in here at some point? Yes, yes, it was definitely on my mind. I was wondering what else was gonna get hit, how many more times this would happen, where it would happen. But at that point, it was what was next. 9.30 a.m. at Washington's Dulles Airport, controllers also on high alert. But what they don't know is that one of their own flights is now missing. American 77. Flight 77 has been out of contact with controllers in Indianapolis for more than 20 minutes. Fighter jets are dispatched to track the flight, but the plane already has turned east, flying back over West Virginia toward Washington, D.C. Todd Lewis is working radar at Dulles Airport. One of my colleagues saw a target moving quite fast from the northwest to the southeast. So we all started watching that target and uh, she notified the supervisor. But nobody knew that was a commercial flight at the time. Nobody knew that was American 77. What, what did you think, it was a military flight of some kind? What you I thought it was a military flight. I thought that uh, Langley had scrambled some fighters and maybe one of them got up there. It was really moving fast. It was moving very fast, like, like a military aircraft might move at a low altitude. How long were you able to track what turned out to be Americans? Well, it, it was heading right towards uh, the prohibited area in downtown Washington and uh, the, that covers the Capitol and the White House. We then called the White House on the hotline to let them know. Controllers activate a hotline to the Secret Service, and within seconds, agents are frantically evacuating the White House. The president is in Florida, but the Secret Service whisked Vice President Dick Cheney into an underground bunker. Then it turns south and away from the prohibited area, which seemed like a momentary sigh of relief and it disappeared, but it was going away from Washington, which seemed to be the right thing. But at 9.38 a.m., the plane does strike, crashing into the Pentagon. What did you think when you heard the Pentagon had been struck? Then there was no question that, yeah, it was a commercial flight. And you're wondering, um, we're being attacked. What's next? Washington, D.C. is where United Flight 93 soon will be headed. As American Flight 77 was breaching Washington's airspace to eventually hit the Pentagon, back in the skies over Youngstown, Ohio, Flight 93 still is on course, now airborne for more than 50 minutes. But now, Stacy Taylor and other controllers watch the plane suddenly start to climb. The controller working Flight 93 tries to contact the cockpit. United 93, Cleveland, do you still hear the center? I was afraid of that flight. I see this plane climbed up from his assigned altitude to 35, of 35,000 feet to 41,000 feet, turned around and aimed right back at where we were and descended rapidly. And when a plane descends too fast, the computer can't keep up with it. And you get X's in the altitude box. 
So we knew he was aimed at us and descending very, very rapidly. At that point, I knew it was confirmed hijacking. I didn't know where they were going, what they were doing. I was worried that we were a target, that the center was a target. I remember looking at the ceiling and thinking, you know, here it comes. We have all shuddered at the thought of what must have been going on in the cockpits of those hijacked airliners. It turns out the Cleveland controller working United Flight 93 at the time, along with supervisors, actually heard the sounds of the struggle in the cockpit. I said, did you guys talk to him? He goes, yeah, we talked to him. I said, what did the pilot, he said, it wasn't the pilots, he said it was the hijackers. I said, the hijackers, I said, are you telling me the hijackers were talking to you on the frequency? He said, the pilot opened up the mic before. He said, we heard it all. I said, what? He said, we heard them being killed. And he said, we heard, and I said, I said, don't tell me anymore. I said, I don't, I don't want to know anymore. And as upsetting as this is, there is still more going on inside Cleveland Center. People, if you can get away from downtown, I would advise you to do so. A false alarm involving another Delta flight en route to Cleveland has officials ordering evacuations. They're evacuating the city of Cleveland. They're evacuating the center as we're all doing all this too. Flight 93 will not strike the Cleveland Center. Instead, like the other three planes before it, it makes a radical turn. Hijackers then shut off Flight 93's transponder signal, just as they had on the other three planes. Controllers can now only see a moving target on radar. They have no other flight information. Back at Newark Tower, where Flight 93 took off only an hour before, Bob Barkatapane is trading phone calls with the FAA Central Command Center in Herndon, Virginia. The command center is telling him there are at least 10 planes they're still suspicious of for one reason or another, all possible hijackings. When I talked to the command center again, he told me that uh, another um, aircraft was being hijacked. And I told, he said, as a matter of fact, it's one of your airplanes. You had a hard time believing that. I didn't believe it at all. I, I was like, what is going on? We were tracking United 93, and I was in conversation with the FBI agent and he was relaying to me that we suspect that this aircraft has uh, now been taken over by hostile forces, described the sharp turn it made over uh, eastern Ohio and now is heading back uh, along southwestern Pennsylvania. And I could tell just by giving it a visual track that it was obviously heading for the Washington, D.C. area. As Flight 93 speeds toward Washington, D.C., the Federal Aviation Administration does something unprecedented in aviation history. Officials at the FAA Command Center order that the national airspace be completely shut down, the grounding yeah, of every right. single yeah. civilian plane in the sky. This FAA animation shows what the skies look like at 9.45 a.m. September 11, 2001. Controllers have already landed more than 1,000 planes from the Boston and New York Air Corridors. There are still 3,949 planes in the air. Controllers must still land every single one as quickly as they can at the nearest possible airport, no matter how far from their intended destination. The controllers began rerouting the planes at the rate of one every second. And people were landing out here in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and Peoria, and all. Oh, they were landing all over the country. This whole system basically just So it, it looks like a daisy field, and suddenly it goes dark. At the Cleveland Center, Stacy Taylor is busy diverting planes to land but can't stop thinking about Flight 93. You're keeping your eye on Flight 93 at this point? Yeah. And then the transponder came back on. We got two hits off the transponder. That's something we've always wanted to know. Why did the transponder come back on? Because the hijackers had shut it off so that they couldn't be tracked, even though we were still tracking them. Now we were getting an altitude readout on the airplane. I can't remember the precise numbers, but it was around 6,400 feet and then around 59 or 5,800 feet. And we're thinking, oh, you know, maybe something's happened. Maybe this isn't what we think it is. But minutes later at 10.03, the transponder shuts off again. Flight 93 disappears from radar. I had another airplane that I was working and I told him, I said, sir, 
I said, I think we have an aircraft down. I said, it's entirely up to you, but if you'd be willing to fly over the last place that we spotted this airplane that, and see if you can see anything. And he's like, yeah, we'll do that. So he flew over, and at first he didn't see anything. And then he said, we see a great big plume or a cloud of smoke. You knew it was down at that point. A number of heroic passengers had launched their own counterattack on the cockpit, preventing the plane from reaching its presumed target, the nation's capital. I know there's been talk about if United 93 was shot down. United 93 was not shot down. I would have known, I would have seen that. Did you see any of the fighters around Flight 93? There were no fighters around Flight United 93. No. And from the way I understand it, if they'd have gone any closer to Washington, then they would have been intercepted. But at the time the flight went down, no, there was no one on him. 10.30 a.m., the FAA's view of the national airspace. In just 45 minutes, controllers have safely landed almost 2,500 planes. But there are still more than 1,500 in the air, and each one is a potential weapon. Controllers still fear that other attacks are planned. Speculation centers on the Sears Tower in Chicago or other landmarks in the nation's capital, even Air Force One. The president's plane still is in the air and controllers worry it could be the next target. The airspace above the United States is in a lockdown. Controllers are furiously diverting planes to land at the nearest possible airport. And aside from military aircraft, only one other plane is allowed to take off. Air Force One, the plane known as the Flying Oval Office. In fact, the Secret Service is purposely keeping the president on the move and away from Washington. You remember hearing about Air Force One, about where it was and where it was going? Yeah, yeah, we knew where it was. We were tracking it. We were tracking it. At 11 a.m., Air Force One still is on the move, en route from Sarasota, Florida, where the president had been speaking to elementary school students that morning, to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana. Was there some discussion in the room about, man, Air Force One is so up there? You... That was one of the uh, potential targets, that factoring in the fact that as many as 10 aircraft were still potentially yes. unaccounted for, yes. and that Air Force One was a potential target, as was the White House as was other, the capital, Washington, D.C. It was a war zone. Our skies were turned into a war zone. Everywhere you turn, it was military jets and helicopters everywhere. And that's when the reality sank in. We're at war. It was nuts. Yeah. 11.30 a.m., more than 3,000 planes have landed safely. But there are more than 900 still to go. Man, how did you keep the concentration on the other planes knowing what had happened here? It's, it's hard, but you do it, because that's what you train to do. Finally, at 12.15 p.m., four hours to the minute when controllers lost contact with that first airliner, they have accomplished their mission for the first time in the history of air traffic control. Dating back to 1938, there is not a single civilian plane in the sky over the U.S. Controllers have accounted for all the suspicious planes. They wonder, but will never know if there were other hijackers with attacks planned that day, plans that were derailed by their quick action. When the chips were down, they delivered. John Carr is the president of the National Air Traffic Controllers Association. He presides over some 15,000 controllers nationwide. When you're talking about an event that no one had practiced, no one had trained for, no one had any idea could possibly unfold before them, to then shut down the system in two and a half hours and land almost 5,000 airplanes without a single error um, is a feat of airmanship that I don't think will ever be equaled. Until now, there has been no time to deal with emotion. But with the airspace clear, the enormity of what has happened, the staggering loss of life hits home. I broke down. I mean, I was just... I broke down. At Boston Center, Pete Zalewski, the first controller to handle a hijacked plane, maintaining composure throughout it all, he finally falls apart. I started crying. I couldn't talk. I started shaking. And I just said, what's wrong with the world? What's, what is happening? There is more bad news for the Boston Center. 
one of the controller's wives actually had been on the American Flight 11, the first plane to hit the World Trade Tower. Doug McKay's wife was on American 11. And... Uh, was he on duty? Doug was actually on his way to work. Doug had dropped his wife off at the airport. The uh, individuals that worked with Doug the evening before uh, knew that his wife was going to be on American 11. And when they found out that American 11 had hit the towers, we stopped Doug at the door and we basically took him aside and brought him into another room and, and uh, we went through uh, taking care of Doug. And it was pretty, pretty tragic. That is part of the brotherhood and sisterhood, isn't it? You have to take care of each other as well as take care of all those airplanes. Huh? It sure is. And on that day, we lost Doug McKay also. He, he could never work again, not, not doing what he was doing before. The skies over America would ultimately remain closed down for three days to civilian aircraft. When flights resumed yes. and controllers came back on duty yeah. in this room after yeah. September 11th, yeah. what was the tone? Very somber. We were more worried about what it done to our, our industry. This is our industry. The pilots, the controllers, the, the users, uh, they'd taken our industry and, and turned it into a complete mess that nobody ever imagined. For many controllers, the coming days and weeks were harder still. Each shift, a waiting game, with controllers wondering, will there be a next time? And if there is, will we be able to stop it? Every little thing that happened, I was jumping up. And any and, tiny little glitch would cause well, Stress was enormous. For Pete Zalewski, no, it was difficult to come back at all. For about a month, I didn't sleep. Um, I was out of work for about six weeks, but I knew there was a point where I would, I would go back. I need, needed my life back. Even before 9-11, controllers in New York were no strangers to tragedy. The crashes of TWA Flight 800, Swiss Air Flight 111, and Egypt Air 990 all happened in or around their airspace. And within weeks of September 11, tragedy would strike again when another American plane, Flight 587, crashes on takeoff into a neighborhood in Queens. Were you working that day? Yes, yes. What did you think when you heard that? Uh, I thought terrorism it had to be. Everyone was kind of waiting for the next shoe to drop. And I think everyone thought, well, all right, or the, new, the next phase of whatever, whatever it is they have in store for us. But investigators now believe a failure of structure, not terrorism, caused the crash of American Flight 587 in Queens. While a year has now safely passed, the shadow of September 11th still hangs over them. Every time an aircraft doesn't do exactly what you tell them, it brings up the thought of what could happen now and what's gonna happen, what is he doing, why is he doing this, why is he not answering, and it brings it right back every time. How much do you worry about the new rules that fighter aircraft may have to shoot down a civilian airliner at some point? Hard to imagine, isn't it? Yeah. If it's hard for us, can you imagine how hard it is for that, that fighter, fighter pilot? pilot? Decision he has to make. Have you been briefed about those contingencies? We have a contingency plans that we've been briefed on. Told to keep it secret? <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> we'd, we'd have to kill you if you said <laughs> Well, let's not go that far. <laughs> but that's a stark new reality in your life, Greg, that uh, an American fighter jet might have to shoot down an airliner filled with civilians because it's been converted into a weapon by someone. Exactly. Right. It's not only planes as weapons, but we're also watching out for sensitive areas such as nuclear power plants. You know, large reservoirs. stadiums, reservoirs, yeah, bridges, and, so and that's added a new dimension to our job. And we feel that we are every bit a part of this nation's defense when it comes to the skies as anybody else, because you know we're going to be the first line there. As today's anniversary approached, most of these controllers have shied away from even reading about it or watching the coverage on television. To stay away. I already know too much, because as I watched the American disappear, the United disappeared, and those were the first two. And I guess I'm the first one to know it. It's an honor you'd rather give up, though, right? Absolutely. I just think about all those people and uh, all the brave people that died there. He remains in awe of the timing of it all. How did they do such a coordinated thing that the American literally disappeared? 
and the United literally got hijacked at almost the same time. And I've always wondered if they were actually talking to each other, saying, I'm going in now, good luck. It's the what ifs that plague the Newark controllers. What if those fighter jets scrambled to intercept the second plane had arrived just a bit earlier? I remember the two F-15s, they were there moments after the impact. And I was just said to myself, if they only could have gotten there a couple minutes earlier. They just missed it. But what would they have done? What do you think they, they would know. have done? I don't know what they have done. You know, 2020 hindsight. They probably no wouldn't have had to shoot it down. But back then, that only came from the president. Right. Yeah. What if Flight 93, delayed so long in the runway at Newark that morning, had been delayed just a few minutes more? It happened a few minutes later. may not have made it off the ground. It may not have made it at all, unfortunately. Each of them struggles with personal memories, moments, images, seared into their consciousness. They will never forget them. I still can hear their voice. That will never go away from me. But just horrific, just the feeling of it, the, the voices, the, um, you knew they had control. You knew they had control and we didn't. And that was very scary because as controllers, you're taught to have control. And there wasn't on that day. They were the four darkest hours in aviation history. But these controllers and their colleagues across the U.S. met an unprecedented challenge that morning one year ago. Their coolness kept other tragedies from occurring, ensuring the safety of more than 350,000 people in the air and countless more on the ground. I know you have professional pride, but when you look back, aren't you a little astonished that it went as well as it did? Uh, the, the people that were working that day did a phenomenal job. I mean, the controls in this country are the best in the world, and I'm proud to be one of them. The men and women with whom we have spent the last hour and their colleagues in air traffic control centers across the country are much more on our minds now. We used to take them for granted. No more. Now we have an insider's appreciation of their critical role in getting us off the ground and headed safely to our destinations, or in times of national emergency, out of the air and back safely on the ground. September 11th was at once the blackest day in their profession and the proudest. It was not their fault the airliners were hijacked, but it was their coolness and resourcefulness that cleared the air and kept other planes from mid-air crashes. And as we learned tonight, they did it with heart. We can't ask for more. <laughs>